Floridian, The Green Guide, by Clouds, My Head in the Clouds Not Coming Down, read by Oakshadow 5, Chapter 75, Reunited, Summary, Old Friends Come Together Again. It was a quiet night, almost peaceful with the way that the last rays of sunset reflected off the ocean, and Kutsky would have even called it photogenic if it weren't for the trash everywhere. It wasn't like he was here for the aesthetic, though, so Katsuki didn't really care. He let himself get lost in his thoughts as the ice cream cones melted on his hands. It was kind of nice, but whatever weird semblance of peace Katsuki had found shattered when he heard a loud crash behind him. He spun around, and both ice cream cones immediately fell to the concrete as he stared in shock at what was happening on the street behind him. The crash he'd heard was a bus being literally thrown across the street and into one of the adjacent buildings. People were screaming, obviously, but there weren't nearly as many civilians running around as Katsuki would have expected. What rooted him to the floor, however, was the thing that was currently tearing its way down the street. At first glance, Katsuki swore that there was no way it could even be human. Inky black tentacles stretched out in every direction and wrapped around everything they could reach, and with the way the thing was backlit from the street lamps that had just turned on, it looked like someone had brought some eldritch horror to life. Katsuki Galvan started backing away slowly. The last thing he wanted was to get on this monster's bad side, especially since he didn't have permission to use his quirk to fight back. He needed to get to safety and make sure the heroes knew what was going on. Then he could worry about what the heck that thing was. It was a fairly decent plan, or would have been, if the monster hadn't chosen that moment to stare straight at him. Katsuki froze and held his breath, hoping that maybe this was a T-Rex sort of situation and the thing wouldn't be able to see him if he didn't move a muscle. For a split second, it almost seemed like his desperate strategy was going to work. Then, the monster charged. Katsuki leapt down onto the beach as fast as he could, weaving his way into the maze of garbage and focusing on disappearing. His heartbeat echoed in his ears, but still didn't do anything to drown out the crashing sound of the garbage towers collapsing as the monster chased him. He almost stumbled as he slid around a corner, but managed to scramble to his feet and keep begging his way around the maze. Shit, shit, shit! Katsuki hissed. Gotta go faster! Izuku turned away from the old man he was helping, just in time to see the berserker had disappeared into the massive piles of garbage that covered the beach, and he sighed in relief. No one ever went down onto the beach, so he didn't have to worry about the monster hurting anyone. Still, unless the berserker was trying to destroy pollution, it was eventually going to realize that whatever it was looking for wasn't there, and Izuku needed to make sure that everyone had already evacuated by the time that happened. He was on his way to another building when Ereza had dropped down in front of him, looking pissed. Problem, child. Just what do you think you're doing? Actually staying away from the main fight for one, Ereza. Izuku smiled. You'd be proud. Ereza had sighed tiredly. Situation. Izuku pointed to the beach. I'm pretty sure it's a berserker. It's got some kind of octopus quirk, from what I can tell. I don't know how far the tentacles can stretch. They're pretty elastic, but I would avoid them if possible. They secrete some kind of ink, which is why I think it's an octopus quirk, not just tentacles, but it's pretty corrosive and I'm not sure your quirk will cancel the effects of it, just the villain's ability to secrete it. Ereza had nodded as he took note of Izuku's analysis. Any idea what's it after? Izuku shook his head. Just that it keeps destroying everything in its path, but doesn't seem to be interested in hurting people like the other berserkers were. That might change when it gets spot off the beach, though. All right. Ereza looked down toward the beach. Amplifier and Rocklock will be here soon, so keep focusing on evacuation and we'll take care of the berserker. Now that you're here, I can... Izuku tried, but Ereza just held up a hand. No. You said it yourself. It's going to get bored of the beach, and we can't have civilians in danger when that happens. Ereza pointed out. Also, you're actively staying out of danger for once, and I'm not gonna do anything to interfere with that. Izuku pouted, but nodded. Just yell if you need any help, okay? Ereza ruffled his hair. Will do, kid. Stay safe. Izuku flashed a white grin. Do I ever? 
Katsuki stumbled again. He really needed to go running in the sand more, apparently, because his legs were starting to burn and the monster behind him wasn't showing any signs of slowing down. He was just pulling himself up when one of the tentacles reached for him. Katsuki's eyes widened as he realized he wasn't going to be able to dodge in time. He braced himself for the inevitable, only to be grabbed by fabric instead. He was pulled behind a fridge and eraser head didn't loosen his capture weapon as he glared down at him. What are you doing here, Bakugo? I thought you were going to stay out of this case. Only until I got into you, eh? Katsuki argued. But for your information, I was not seeking out this villain at all. I was just hanging on the beach. Then this fucking monster started chasing me. Eraser had looked at him skeptically. Viridian said the berserker wasn't going after people. Well, then Viridian was wrong, Katsuki snapped. Because, look out! He and Ereza had rolled in opposite directions and both barely managed to get out of the way before one of the trash towers came toppling down where they'd been. Katsuki didn't look behind him to see if the monster was following before he started running, but the crashes behind him were more than enough to paint a pretty good picture of how screwed he was. He heard someone scream and then there was an even bigger crash. Katsuki looked back and saw Amplifier in a battle stance, obviously having used her quirk to knock over one of the trash piles onto the monster and buy them a little bit of time. She didn't relax at all as she stared where the monster had been, only looking away to give Katsuki a once-over and make sure he wasn't injured. Are you okay, Kachan? Katsuki pressed his hands on his knees and tried to catch his breath. What the fuck? What even is that thing? A bioengineered superweapon. Iriza had flanked the other side. Or at least the villain factory's best attempt at one. Katsuki took one last gulp of air and straightened. So, kind of what happened to Endeavor? Amplifier nodded. Yeah, pretty much. Great, Katsuki drawled. So was screwed. We've beat these things before, Eraser had said. And Roklock's on his way. Viridian is also in the area, but if he's willing to stay away, I'm not going to complain. The fewer kids we can have throwing themselves into life threatening situations, the better, even if they are my future students. Katsuki gritted his teeth. Didn't see this out, hobo. We can argue about this later, Amplifier yelled. We've got company. Katsuki flexed his hands as the junk in front of them started to shift, but Eraser stopped him with a glare. Absolutely not. Run. That's an order. Katsuki glared at him. But... This is a real villain, Kachan, Eraser said firmly. You have zero combat training and even less experience. Find Viridian and help with evacuation if you want to be involved. But this is not your fight. Got it? Don't make me expel you before you even start your way. Katsuki scowled and considered disobeying and charging at the monster, just to spite him. The old would have done it. The Katsuki of ten months ago wouldn't have even hesitated to leap into the fight, but he wasn't that person anymore. He couldn't jump into fights without thinking, just because he wanted to beat something up, and he couldn't just disobey a direct order from a pro-hero, not if he wanted to keep his place in the hero course and be the hero he actually needed to be. He only hesitated for one more second before growling and turning tail. He heard Amplifier shout a warning and Eraser had grunted as something crashed behind him, but Katsuki forced himself not to look over his shoulder as he raced through the maze as quickly as he could. He passed Rocklock as he arrived, but didn't spare anything more than a nod to introduce himself as he ran. As much as Katsuki hated it, as long as he wasn't allowed to use Squirk and fight, he was dead weight, and the faster he got off the beach, the faster the heroes could do their job without worrying about him or other idiot extras getting hurt in the crossfire. He pushed himself a little faster. He was going to be a hero. He'd save people soon enough. Izuku helped another civilian down a set of stairs and handed them off to the police, who had finally arrived a few minutes ago. They were halfway through creating a police line, so Izuku wasn't too worried about anyone except maybe a few intrepid reporters wandering into the evacuated area. The noises from the beach were getting louder and closer, so Izuku worked twice as hard to make sure everyone was safe. It was weird being on the side of the fight. He knew that heroes had different specializations. For example, Eraser had focused on villain takedown, while well, heroes, like Thirteen, focused more on rescue. But Izuku hadn't really come into this whole vigilante thing with a plan, so he just ended up doing whatever was necessary to keep people safe, and usually that was either fighting or intelligence gathering. 
He'd never really just taken a fight to focus on rescue before. It was bittersweet. On the one hand, he was saving people, which was the point, and every grateful person and even the ungrateful people gave him one more reason to keep going and was one more example of how he wasn't completely useless, but on the other, it brought up too many painful memories of long nights anchored in front of a computer screen watching Ahmed's debut on repeat. Izuku sighed to himself and pulled a civilian from one of the cars the berserker had overturned. He was probably just more sensitive to nostalgia because of his conversation with Ahmed earlier. It was like a bruise that was just a little more tender than everything else, but nothing that he needed to worry about too much. Still, he couldn't help his mind from wandering and wondering if Ahmed would be here helping with rescue if he hadn't gotten his injury. Maybe if things had been different and Ahmed hadn't been injured and Izuku had gotten a quirk, they would be working side by side to keep people safe instead of having to budget time and use loopholes to help people. Izuku shook his head and forced himself to focus. Being a hero wasn't in the cards for him, but being a vigilante was better than he ever could have realistically expected, so he had no right to be sad. He was helping people and being useful, and that was what was important. Izuku threw himself into the rescue work. He was happy with what he had. He just had to keep going. He ran toward another overturned car and squinted as it suddenly got a little darker. Sure, the sun had pretty much set, but the street lamps had turned on a while ago, and there were a consistent brightness, so why... He glanced upward and his eyes widened behind his goggles as he took in the massive swarm of bees hovering around the street lamps and blocking out part of their light. Queen Bee had joined the fight. Shota leapt around to avoid both the tentacles and the ink trails they left behind, all while trying not to get tetanus. Maybe he should suggest a training ground based on this place and make the students think on their feet while traversing unpredictable obstacles. Nezu would probably love the idea of making the kids run constantly changing mazes like this, if they could figure out how it would work from a reliability standpoint. But Shota could deal with that later. For now, he had to deal with a berserker who was not only physically powerful, but mentally as well at least in comparison to the ones they'd fought in the past. The monster was able to strategize, at least roughly, and had even successfully managed a feint earlier where it had pretended to be trained to wrap around Amplifier to distract her from the tentacles that were grabbing a refrigerator. If Shota hadn't activated his quirk when he had, and temporarily immobilized the tentacles, it probably would have even managed to throw the thing and Amplifier would have been a smear on the pavement. Well, on the sand. Which is another inconvenient sign that this berserker was actually capable of thought. Sometime during the fight, it had apparently put together that Shota was responsible for the long seconds when the tentacles stopped moving and had logically decided to throw sand in his eyes and used the brief moments when he blinked to tear away his goggles. Every time Shota got close, he found another handful of sand being flung on his face. It was getting really frustrating. Oh, and to make it worse, it was targeting his student. Classes hadn't even started yet. He wasn't paid enough for this. Get out of my way, the monster snarled. Back go. No, Amplifier yelled, dealing another blow to one of the tentacles. He's just a kid. I won't let you touch him. The monster snarled again and wrapped his tentacles around the nearest trash mount, pulling objects out from the base and throwing them at the heroes as the rest of the pile came crashing to the ground. Seriously, between Amplifier and other crashes, the sweat was almost louder than fighting with Mike. Rocklock sprinted out from one of the paths between the garbage. What's going on? How can I help? It's after one of our informants, Amplifier yelled. Immobilize the tentacles, as many as you can. Rocklock nodded in confirmation and dashed for the nearest tentacle. The monster simply tried to swipe him away like a fly, but the moment Rocklock made contact, he smirked and the tentacle was frozen in midair. Let's see how you deal with that. The monster howled and tossed Rocklock away with a tentacle around his ankle, but Rocklock was able to immobilize the tentacle as well before he went flying. Shota almost sighed in relief. At least now, the fight would stay within a small radius and they wouldn't have to worry about the fight getting back onto the street. Now that the monster was basically captive, it shouldn't take too long to take it the rest of the way down. He should have known better than to jinx it. Don't have time for this. The monster slurred its words as it spoke, but it sounded more like the drunks Shota arrested occasionally rather than the stilted way berserkers tried to talk as their brains forgot how to. Bakugo is long gone, Shota snapped. 
We're not going to let you hurt him. The monster turned and Shota only had a split second to see the sheer anger in its eyes before he found himself flinching away from another wave of sand. Amplifier and Rocklock both yelled and it was only after a few seconds when he'd wiped the sand from his face that he remembered what else Viridian had warned him about. They had no idea how far those tentacles could stretch. Katsuki only slipped a few times as he raced toward the street, scrambling around every twist and turn as he tried to ignore the crashes behind him. He didn't know a whole lot about berserkers and all the weird experiments the villain factory did, but from what he'd seen on the news, every time there was a suspiciously powerful villain like this one, they had caused destruction until someone showed up to fight them, then focused on the person trying to stop them. So even though he knew he was probably just being paranoid, it was both frustrating and concerning that this weirdo monster seemed to still be following him. Shouldn't it have given up by now? He could see the screech now and rest water in relief. It was almost completely dark now and it was starting to get hard to see obstacles clearly on the beach, so if he could at least get to the street lamps... Katsuki heard another crash behind him, closer this time. He instinctively looked over his shoulder and immediately wished he hadn't. The black of the monster's tentacles blended in with the gathering darkness and made it look even bigger than it was. It looked like something from a horror movie, and Katsuki could hardly tell even where the monster's body ended and the tentacles began. Of course, he just had to play into the dumb blonde tropes as the universe chose that moment to make him trip over a broken toaster that he'd missed in the dark, and he went tumbling to the ground. He ended up on a spot and scrambled backwards away from the monster as the heroes finally caught up. So much for immobilizing it, Rocklock panted. Eraser! On it. Eraser growled, and the tentacles stopped writhing for a second as Rocklock hurried around to do who knew what, and Amplifier started attacking the monster's body. Get out of here, Kachan! Amplifier ordered. Just run and don't look back! Kachan scrambled to his feet and started running again intending to obey the order, but then the monster screamed. It was a loud, ugly sound, but that wasn't what made Katsuki freeze in place. No, what made Katsuki freeze and whip around was the fact that he recognized the voice. Bakugo! Ogawa screamed. Kachan! Help! Oh my gosh! Ogawa, the berserker, trying to call for help from Kacha is just, oh, it's so sad. And, like, he isn't aware that he's, like, a berserker. And he's trying to get to Kacha to, like, hey, friend, I'm back. What were you doing? And the heroes in Viridian are like, oh, no, a berserker, we have to stop him. It's just so sad. But anyways, guys, I hope you all enjoyed chapter 75 of Red in the Green Guide, and I'll see you all next time. Bye!